be um, admitting people as they log into the webinar. So without further ado, because we have um, a restricted time for today's webinar, I'm going to move into introductions. Um, I want to thank everybody who's taken the time to join us this afternoon for this very important um, conversation. And the theme for today's webinar is affordable housing as a path towards economic development. Um, the webinar has been put together by FSD Uganda in partnership with the Center for Affordable Housing Finance in Africa. Um, you'll see from the screen that we aim to have a program that's as interactive as possible. We have a very eminent panel that's going to be discussing some of the challenges and possible mitigations to help unlock financing for affordable housing in Uganda. Um, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, I'd really ask all our participants to keep yourselves on mute. You've been automatically muted as you joined in, but we request that you maintain the same. We will be recording the session and sharing the session as well, so kindly take note of that. Um, I'd want to ask you to make use of the Q&A chat function to share any of your questions as you move along with the program, and we'll have a Q&A session at the tail end of the webinar. Um, an additional note to that, if, if you could go a step further and link your questions to specific panelists, we'd really appreciate that. And um, finally, if you have any additional inquiries, we included our email addresses and contact details in the invitation and reminder. And we'll also be sharing a follow-up survey after this call. And we look forward to welcoming any additional qualitative and quantitative feedback. So once again, welcome. And I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, David Gardner, who is going to, sorry, I'm going to hand over the call to our executive director, Rashmi Pillai, who's going to give us the opening address before we move into the presentation being made by David Gardner. Rashmi, you're welcome. Thank you, Diana, and good afternoon. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Rashmi Pillai. I'm the Executive Director of Financial Sector at Evening Uganda. We're very excited to host this webinar with the Center for Affordable Housing, KCR David, um, and the entire uh, CAF team and FSD Uganda team have been talking about this for some time now. So we are very excited that it has come together. Uh, I would also like to thank our panelists uh, for today's uh, webinar. I'm sure they will be uh, introduced again, but I would like to thank the Commissioner for Financial Services at the Ministry of Finance, uh, Moses Oguapus, you're welcome. Um, I would like to thank the Commissioner, Housing Development, Irene. Um, you're welcome, Irene, and double thank you because uh, you're the only woman on the panel. So I hope you will also touch upon, along with other panelists, the dimensions of gender and asset ownership, especially housing and lands. Um, I would like to thank Michael um, as the Chief Executive Officer of Housing Finance Bank. Michael, you're welcome. Edward Mkangi, the Executive Director of Pride Microfinance, and Matthew Rukari from the National Social Service, the Security Fund. All of you are welcome. Thank you, panelists. And we look forward to a very exciting discussion today. I'll keep my remarks very brief. Um, I'll give context on who we are, why we're organize, uh, organizing this webinar, and what the next steps are, and how does this all um, come together for FSD Uganda and for CAF, hopefully. Um, so about ourselves, FSD Uganda is the leading financial sector think and do tank in the country. Uh, we are, um, in terms of our work, our scope of work has, uh, over the past five years, spanned across working with um, policymakers, industry associations under our business environment or enabling environment pillar. We have supported the entire financial services industry on market infrastructure which is to say, how does information and uh, money move in an economy? What are the rules of the game? What are the shared services that allow for it? For example, we supported the rollout of the agent banking services, especially the shared agent banking services in Uganda under the Uganda Bankers Association. We supported the rollout of the SAGE program uh, that is under the Ministry of Gender. Um, we also work extensively with the private sector to understand some of the big constraints around financial inclusion. Uh, we ask ourselves uh, questions around why is retail insurance penetration very low? Uh, 
Why is asset ownership very low? And in particular, asset ownership helps in long-term resilience of people. It also can prevent people from going back into old age poverty. And this is the air dimension that um, David, Casia, and the panelists will also speak about. In, I also wanted to add that going forward, you know, FSD Uganda, based on the data that we've collected, we've realized that just working on the supply side of the financial sector is necessary, but it's insufficient in oil of itself. So uh, apart from working on policy as well as market infrastructure and the supply side of development of products and services, we are also trying to look at various sectors and ask ourselves the question of what is the role of finance along this value chain and how can the role of uh, and, and how can we create meaningful products and services and interventions that make a difference to every single actor. Of course, that requires first an assessment of what are those binding constraints. Is it finance or is it non-finance related? And if it is non-finance related, working with stakeholders to unlock those constraints so that finance can come in. So I'm assuming that our panelists will talk about some of the financial and non-financial constraints as well. Um, and the way we plan to work on, uh, on sectors like housing, for example, is to work with partners like the Center for Affordable Housing, which is a center of excellence on uh, bringing some of these ideas and interventions and programs together. They have done extensive research in Uganda, apart from other African countries, and David will definitely talk about them. The other aim that we as FSD Uganda have is uh, we have a very strong partnership with the Ministry of Finance. Hopefully, Moses will agree agree with me. Um, and one of the key uh, issues we've identified with Uganda's financial sector development strategy, as well as the NDP3, um, has been the issue around um, a big supply demand mismatch of housing, especially housing for middle income and low income communities and uh, people. So it would be important for the panel and for all of us, and we look forward to understanding what, where these gaps are, um, how see, what is the size of the problem? Them, and how can we address the problem in a in a in a sustainable manner? So um, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak, and I look forward to a very exciting panel. Great, thanks a lot for that, Rashmi. Um, David, I'll now hand over to you to introduce yourself and take us through today's presentation. Thank you very much, Rashmi, for the opening comments. Um, we really do look forward to today. It's uh, amazing to see the number of people who have shown an interest in this topic. We believe, as I will conclude my session with, that uh, Uganda is at a specifically important moment in being able to use housing as a major component of its developmental strategy going forward. At no time has this been more important than uh, during and after COVID. And we would really like to see that uh, we are able to contribute to that debate in a meaningful way and to create real possibilities for engagements between different sectors in order to make sure that housing does its best to contribute to economic development and recovery. I will be specifically talking about the impact of housing on Uganda's economy based on the findings of CAF's housing economic value chain and housing cost benchmarking study which was undertaken uh, a short while ago. And it's really great now to, to be able to bring it back into the open and hope we, we are hoping it will be the catalyst for various activities moving on from this. I think there is uh, no bigger economy than the whole economy of a country. So from the perspective of the FSD Uganda's agenda and CAF's agenda, this issue of housing economies is an absolutely critical one for us to understand. And uh, myself, David Gardner, and my colleagues, Keith Lockwood and Yakus Pina, have now been involved in almost 10 African countries looking specifically at this issue uh, of what impact does housing have on the economy? Where is that impact felt in the economy? And then critically for CAF, as well as for FSDU, is what do we do about it? How do we actually use those levers that we are learning about to grow the impact of housing and to make sure that the supportive aspects of policy and legislation provide the best possible framework for that to be improved. So I'm going to start with two initial thoughts. One is a long one and the other is a short one. So this in essence 
is a slide that is almost an executive summary of what I'm going to be presenting in the next half an hour. Um, it has been developing over time through CAF's work, and really it is about distilling out the 10 key impacts from housing investments in an economy. Now, when we think housing investments, we often don't think about those sorts of houses sitting in the middle of the slide. But in reality, that is the most pervasive form of housing across Africa. And it's something that we need to understand and embrace and recognize the power of. And as you will see later, specifically perhaps in Uganda, it's absolutely critical that we don't necessarily understand the billions, but we understand the thousands and the tens of thousands of dollars that individual households contribute into the housing economy. So let's start with impact one, household savings and resources and income is spent on housing rather than on other things. And that is critical. It is around this issue of what are you doing with your income uh, and what is that doing for you as a household or as an individual going forward in your life. Number two, when you invest in housing, you create long-term housing investment. And that is critical, not only to building asset bases in housing, but also to contributing to the stability and growth of national economies. Number three, we are creating households, housing for more households. Even if it is a very modest structure, as you see in the middle of that slide, housing three households, it is something that is better than nothing. And it is the start of a very long process of investing in the housing ladder. Number four, these housing investments generate regular escalating household income. There is literally no better way in most African cities than housing for the average person who has access to some land to generate ongoing household income. Number five, the economic value added to the economy during construction grows. And that is absolutely critical as I will be showing you as you build a house, um, the economy builds along with that. Number six, it stimulates inputs upstream in the economy through primary, but specifically secondary manufacturing and construction and tertiary services sectors. Then number seven, it creates a fixed capital engine of the economy that keeps on growing. Housing is recognized as part of gross fixed capital formation, but we really don't yet have a sense of how important that is in the lower echelons of the housing ladder. And this engine is one that is indicating itself as a major engine for growth in our economies. Number eight, when you invest in housing, you stimulate demand for other linked goods and services, albeit security, garden services, furniture, perhaps even information technology and other sectors. Number nine, when we invest in housing, government wins. Government services, government taxation, and other parts of government expenditure are stimulated through that process. And finally, number 10, when we invest in housing, we create a base for further household investment, not only in housing, but also in economic activities and uh, various other aspects of investment that Rashmi touched on just now as well around um, old age and the ability to, to sustain livelihoods throughout uh, the, a, a person's life cycle. So that is what we're going to be talking about in more detail, these 10 impacts that housing has on the economy um, as we are investing and growing our housing economies. The second thought is just to mention that, the, that CAF is, the, is a part of a group of housing focused organizations that are aiming to elevate the importance of housing as a response strategy to COVID-19. Please go and look for the Cornerstone of Recovery report. Um, we believe it is an absolutely critical element to the growth of post-COVID economy. And if we all understand the potentials for it, I think it'll, it'll assist dramatically in the recovery and the further growth of economies going forward. This initiative is one uh, undertaken by CAF, HOFINET, Affordable Housing Institute, and Habitat for Humanity through the Tuiliga Center. So now let's get on to the overview of the study. Uh, you would have seen the document uh, that has been around now for a couple of months, and it is available on CAF's website, and it is a pretty dense and, and, and uh, information-filled document. I do hope that at some stage you will sacrifice an evening of your life 
to go through it and get a sense of what you can do. But if not, I'm hoping I can share the key components of it with you now. So this report is part of a series that CAF has undertaken into housing and the economy in African countries. It is based on a four-stage methodology. Number one, a contextual analysis that examines demographic and macroeconomic issues and gets a sense of what's going on in the housing sector from a supply and demand perspective. Number two, it looks at developing housing economic value chains. And this is really around looking at a macro level economic analysis that gives a sense of what is happening in residential construction and residential real estate. Number three, it then looks at a market analysis, which starts, it starts understanding what the, the dynamics of the housing market mean for affordability and for the types of housing that can be that should be provided and are being provided and what can be done to improve those issues in the economy. And then number four, it looks at CAF's housing cost benchmarking study methodology to get a clear understanding of what comprises housing cost in Uganda, how that compares across products within Uganda's market, but more importantly, how it compares across African countries in terms of uh, the cost effectiveness of housing construction. And this is what I will be taking you through now um, in the next uh, half an hour or so. So let's start with the conceptual analysis. We look at a housing pyramid where we consider on the left-hand axis household incomes from low to high and a sense of what the broad bands of household income are. We've separated those into very clear dollar-based uh, categories simply for conceptual understanding. We then look at a split between the 75% or 7 million rural households in, in Uganda and the 25% or 2.4 million urban households in Uganda. And we look then at what that means in terms of the number of households in each band down the right hand side and specifically then what that looks like in terms of a housing pyramid of the basic numbers of households in each category. So what is clear to start is that Uganda's economy is still a rural economy from the perspective of households, but that it is the urban areas which are growing the fastest and face the largest uh, housing need. What we see is a relatively poor allocation of households, the low income bands predominate, and it is important for us to recognize uh, also that the vast majority of households are looking at incomes way below $3,000 per month. And, and rather, it is important that we start looking at affordability for products that are way down the pyramid in terms of people earning way less than $1,000 or, uh, or 1.1 million shillings per month. So that gives us a sense of the broad structure of the housing economy that we're looking at and that we need to make sure that when we are building accommodation, that we are not only concentrating on these sorts of products that we see at the very top of the housing pyramid, but we need to be cognizant of what we provide to these lower houses, uh, lower income houses, who currently are often faced uh, with slum situations or the inability to access any housing beyond basic rental housing. What we then can look at is, is the tenure format of these different houses. And what we see is a Uganda at a very specific point in time in its housing economy. And that is one where it is roughly 50-50 split between rented and owned houses. Now we know from other African countries that what is very likely to happen is that as urbanization increases, unless we have a very solid approach to developing um, housing purchase markets, we will see this rental factor dramatically rising to the point where if we look at Lagos, for instance, we're looking at well over 80% of households renting and in many other African situations, 60 to 70% of households renting. Rental is an important component of housing, but what is critical is that we do not get to the point of a rental dominated housing market where people do not have the ability to access affordable ownership, particularly at the lower end of the housing market. So that becomes a key parameter that we need to consider when we start looking at the housing market going forward. I won't dwell on this slide, but just to say that if you look at housing affordability, bear in mind this column here in terms of a maximum house price that is probably affordable to households of different in income categories on the left-hand side. And bear in mind as we start looking at the, at the cost benchmarking, 
that we really do need to start looking at how we can provide housing way below the 20,000 mark uh, to make sure that households are beginning to start uh, to access housing in those lower income categories. So what is important from this analysis is that we identify six key ways that Ugandan households in urban areas procure housing. By far the most pervasive one at the moment is through informal market rental. The rental of basic structures or rooms in homes um, or tenement type of accommodation. Number two, through increased population densities, we see increases in sharing and increasing amounts of people living in slum-like conditions where population densities start exceeding what they should be in those areas. Number three, we see extensive extension of existing houses through the addition of rooms or, or, or structures. And even in many, in many parts of, of, of the key cities, people starting to verticalize, to start looking at creating second and third stories on their houses. We then see the other, fourthly, the in, informal incremental owner building as the major mechanisms through which new housing is created. And indeed that housing units are created through which the informal market rental operates. Number four becomes the major economic driver of housing in Uganda. And it's something we will come back to later in the presentation. Fifth, we look at formal housing rental where existing houses on the market are rented out if they're formal for relatively large dollar based amounts in many cases. And then we have a very thin but growing sector of formal housing purchase, which is really around the market generation aspect of mortgaged housing um, being, being developed and sell, sold um, on the real estate markets. Those are important because it gives us a sense of the sorts of markets we need to be dealing with in our housing finance category markets, as well as in our uh, various policy instruments as we go through the presentation. So let's now look at the economic impact of housing construction and real estate in Uganda. We want to answer a very basic question. What does housing construction and rental contribute to the economy of Uganda? And where does this contribution occur in the economy so that we can know those impacts and work on making them better? I'm going to go through a few contextual slides. The first one to say is that Uganda has at the moment a pretty low per capita GDP um, on par with Rwanda, but significantly below other countries in Africa. What we, what we know from the studies so far is that generally the lower the per capita GDP, the higher the average contribution of the housing sector is to the economy. So as you will see later, Uganda as a proportion of its economy has a particularly high stimulation impact from housing. And that is a positive factor that we need to work on as we, as we develop Uganda's economy going forward. We then need to look at what's happening on the relative trends in real GDP of the major sectors of the economy. And the two that we are really interested in is the growth in construction and then the growth ultimately in real estate as well. And we see those two as exceeding many of the other sectors of the economy, which is positive and something that we need to consider working on as we go forward. We believe it can be more, um, but it is critical to see that those are two growing sectors. Suffice it to say, we don't see the COVID impact here, but at the same stage, the recovery is likely to follow those initial trajectories from prior to COVID. We then see that from a sectoral composition of Uganda's real GDP, that once again, real estate at 6% and construction at 7% are important components of the economy. We also want to state up front that we believe those figures are understated, specifically with respect to the informal sector contribution. And we also see and believe that they could be significantly growing faster than is indicated in these slides showing the, the trend from over the last 10 years from 2008 to 2018. In this slide, we then start looking at a very important element, which is the informal economy contributions uh, to GDP. And I think what is absolutely critical to recognize here is this massive informal contribution in real estate, uh, which is way beyond many of the other countries that we have worked at. So this is not necessarily a bad thing, but it does indicate the need to look at formalizing Uganda's housing real estate economy. Um, 
similarly and not unusually, we have a very high level of informality in the construction sector as well. That we see across the continent, but it is also an, an, an element that needs to be considered. In terms of real estate, that is something we will come back to later. And I think it's also important to note that it is way above the average level of informality at 38.7% of the total economy that is, that is uh, the case in many other countries uh, in Africa. It does put Uganda roughly halfway on this graph, but it does indicate that there's a lot more that needs to happen there. What we then look at is a housing economic value chain. Now, basically, this is around the recipe for housing in the economy. We are saying that you put intermediate inputs in the form of building materials and services, and you mix them together with gross value added in the form of labor and indirect taxes and subsidies and other gross operating surpluses that happen through um, the development of, for instance, uh, housing uh, sector players, such as contractors and developers. And from that, you get a domestic production of housing, which in turn is matched to domestic supply. And that creates a demand for housing uh, in the domestic economy, which ultimately then leads to a final demand, either being part of the gross capital formation of the country, which is really that fixed capital engine we spoke about earlier, or indeed it is housing consumption in the form of people paying for rents. So what we're interested in is how big is this domestic production as a part of Uganda's GDP? Uh, and what, what and where does it contribute to the different sectors of Uganda's primary, secondary, and tertiary economic sectors? So that's what we will be looking at now. What we do is we look at various information out there in the Ugandan uh, uh, housing and economic sectors, and we use those to build this model uh, that we have uh, nuanced over the last couple of years. Now, luckily, Uganda Bureau of Statistics and the IMF have basic, uh, or not basic, relatively good um, information around supply and use tables. But what we have found is that we lack a significant amount of information about the breakdowns into the sectoral components of both the rental and the, the construction side of housing. And that's something perhaps that we can pick up, and pick up later as we go through the presentation. So let's then look at the component of the economy that we that we are considering. Essentially, CAF is interested at this stage primarily in the direct impact, which is where housing impacts <laughs> most critically on the on, on the economy of Uganda. What we are not looking at in detail yet is indirect impacts as well as induced impacts of housing in the economy which means the figures that we are showing to you today are understated in terms of the total growth impact that housing has on Uganda's economy. But what we wanting to indicate is the importance of this direct impact and critically how it impacts Uganda's economy and what we can do about growing the impact of housing on that economy. So let's then now look at the estimated economic value chain for housing construction in Uganda. We are saying in total, we estimate that construction alone is worth 7.2% of GDP in terms of its direct impact. 2.4% of that comes from gross value added, <clears throat> which is the, the, the value that is created from the inputs into housing. And 4.8% is based on the intermediate inputs from specifically the secondary and to a lesser extent the, the tertiary sectors of the economy. So manufacturing and construction in the secondary sectors and then the service or tertiary sector at the other side of the economy. So we have a very significant impact. I will come back to that figure just now, but suffice it to say that this alone is greater than the 5% that was indicated in the housing policy document of a couple of years back. And so we believe that in fact, when it is fully accounted for Uganda's housing economy in the construction sense is probably even bigger than this. What is important is that this is an important creator of gross capital formation and that this is part of the housing engine as well as the engine for other aspects of the economy such as the growth of SMMEs, uh, many of whom operate through um, houses on the ground. Let's then turn to, to looking at an, another aspect of the analysis that, that we did, which is around Uganda's performance in terms of building materials and export building materials. This is something we're particularly concerned about, that if you look at the total of 44 categories of building material products 
that, that Uganda's economy develops, 26 of those are actually in sectors where Uganda lost world market share between 2013 and 2018. And um, only 12 of them are in sectors where Uganda gained market share between 2013 and 2018. If we look at that in another way, we are looking at a significant negative trade balance in building materials in Uganda. Um, and this is particularly problematic as well in that almost all of Uganda's trade exports in building materials is within the, 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 the local um, community there, with, with, within um, uh, the Kamesa community. And what that really means is that Uganda itself is becoming less competitive from a building materials supply input. And what that also means is that it is probably negatively affecting Uganda's ability to operate in these sectors as well. So there are some recommendations around that later. When we turn to housing rental, we see that rental is not nearly as large as housing uh, construction. We consider the impact to be around 3.7% of GDP a very small proportion of that which comes from services and the secondary sectors, and the most of which comes from the gross value added components, which is really around real, real estate services. Now, bearing in mind that factor of 98% of Uganda's um, real estate sector being informal, this is perhaps not surprising, but it does mean that there's major potential for growth and formalization of Uganda's real estate economy and that that could be an area for significant growth of services in the country going forward as well. So just looking at this, I wanted to make the, the point here that if we look at formal and informal contributions to real estate in the last 10 years, the first thing is that it has grown four and a half times from around 1,000, sorry, uh, from, from around uh, 1 billion US dollars to 4.5 billion US dollars over that period. But the contribution of the informal sector, sorry, of the formal sector is still significantly small. So what we would really want to see is the growth of the formal sector, as well as the overall continued growth of real estate in the country. Together then, we are saying that housing real estate and housing construction probably contribute 11% to the GDP of Uganda. And that's roughly 6% of that is from uh, gross value added and 5.2% is from uh, intermediate inputs into the housing sector. And that this part of the economy has a significant stimulus effect on the secondary sectors and to a lesser extent on the services sector of Uganda's economy. So it is absolutely critical that we continue to build this major driver of Uganda's um, economic growth going forward. There is a significant proportion of the value add that also comes from labor remuneration, which is very critical as well. And in addition to that, a huge proportion which comes from gross operating surplus. And a lot of that has to do with the financial engine of the economy, which we will come back to later. So let's now then look <coughs> at some key factors. I'm not going to dwell on this, uh, this slide, but I do want to say that in terms of per capita GDP, looking at PPP rates in order to get comparisons between countries, you, uh, Uganda currently has a very low level of total per capita spending on housing construction and rental. Although it is above Rwanda it is, it, it, and, and Kenya, it is still very low in comparison to other African countries, which means that there's significant potential for growth in the amount that Ugandans are spending on housing if we can find the right mechanisms of making that happen. I'm going, to, I'm going to now go on to the housing cost benchmarking because I do want to spend some time on the conclusions as well. CAF's housing cost benchmarking methodology answers the question, how much does it really cost to develop a basic 55 square meter formally constructed house in a major urban center in a country such as Uganda? Now, we all tend to throw figures around about what housing costs, but what we discovered at CAF is that we were almost always getting the wrong figure when we asked people why that, what it costs. And there are so many reasons for that. But the most critical one is that this is a very complex equation. And we need to start looking at what all the different parts uh, of housing cost are. We have a construction component, which is the one we all tend to think about, bricks and mortar and pipes and roofing, and what that costs. But what we tend to forget about is often the cost of land 
And specifically also in many economies, land is to some extent subsidized or has different arrangements around costs, which are often not taken, taken into account. So land is critical. We then need to look at infrastructure and the cost of that as well, which is often also subsidized or semi-subsidized in many markets. We then have major compliance costs, which are often forgotten about because they happened long ago or because we just don't tend to put them into the mix in terms of looking at housing costs overall. And then a full range of other housing costs, such as financial costs, sales tax, marketing costs, et cetera. So what we do at CAF is we put all of that together in a complex model that, that looks at over 300 data points. And we then look at coming up with a standardized definition of that cost broken down into these different categories. And what we see very critically is that in the Ugandan context in Kampala in 2019, that only 43% of housing costs are actually construction related. So that is not unusual across the continent, but do bear in mind that that means that only half of the cost of the house is what it costs to build. We then need to consider all of these other costs, which include value added taxes, uh, developer overheads, and whether that is excessive or not in terms of profits and other overheads that developers incur. Um, other development costs that, that, that are put into the mix, and then compliance costs and infrastructure costs over here at the other side of, of, the, of the circle. So what we have is a much better breakdown of housing costs to look at. What we then do is we look at this basic standard 55 square meter CAF house, exactly the same uh, um, architectural design, exactly the same quantity surveyor spec, and we look at its cost versus other countries on the continent. And what we see that Uganda sits, I'm not quite sure whether we should say comfortably or uncomfortably in the middle between Kenya and Tanzania, where there are significantly inflated costs, and Nigeria and South Africa with slightly lesser costs. But there are two specific things I want to indicate here which are absolutely critical. The first is a 50% difference between the cost of the same house in South Africa and that cost in Uganda, which means we have a long way to go in Uganda in terms of getting better quality, sorry, better value out of the housing economy. There are many things that can be done to, to get to, towards that parity in South Africa. And the second thing I want to say is that in South Africa, we are still far from improving what we pay for our housing. So let's not think that South Africa is a good benchmark. Uh, there is a long way to go on the continent for us to look at this basic costing of a basic 55 square meter two bedroom house costing just under 60,000 US dollars. Now, I know many of you are thinking that that is way high compared to what you see in the market. But what we challenge you to do is to go and delve into those statistics and look at how we've quantified what we have done, because then it will become clearer that in fact, there are so many aspects that we often forget about when we are quantifying housing cost, And that is why we tend to find this major, uh, very expensive aspect of housing. And often the housing costs that are being put onto the market are in fact in some way either undercounted or subsidized in some way in that we tend to overlook when we start looking at what they actually cost out there. What we then do is we break that housing cost down into various different components of those major cost categories we, we looked at just now. So what we can then start doing is saying across these five countries, what is happening in terms of the cost of construction, which is the red, the cost of services, the cost of land at the very bottom, and then the other cost categories as they, as, as they are outlined. So we can then start seeing as we delve into this level, as well as the underlying level of these different uh, component costs, about what is happening specifically in the Ugandan economy. And unfortunately, we don't have time to go into that in too much detail, um, but suffice it to say that there are significant reasons and ways that we can improve those housing costs. We also then look at the costs of different types of housing in Uganda, specifically medium and high rise, and then different sizes of detached houses. And what we can see from that is that there are major differences in the overall construction costs of the two products, which are um, verticalized in terms of being over one story, and the costs of specifically infrastructure and land in terms of those products, which are single story. 
And again, that has various lessons around the densification of, of housing in Uganda and how we need to start considering the configurations of different housing developments in the country. So let's now spend a bit of time on conclusions and recommendations. From a conclusion perspective, we see a major opportunity for Uganda to create a more orderly response to the inevitable rapid urbanization that is now starting. Uganda sits at 25% urbanization, but there is no doubt that in 10 years, we will be looking at a fundamentally different figure. And we have the opportunity now to capture uh, a response that will assist in ensuring that the next 25% um, is not solely housed in slums and in rented accommodation. These urban trends will, will create important shifts in the housing sector as well. There's going to be an increase, we trust, in household income. And there's also going to be a need for much more housing in different locations that will need to be uh, put in place. So the housing challenge will require different responses to what have been implemented up to now. Then the contribution of the housing sector to economic growth can definitely be increased. The formality of the economy, the overall impact on the economy, and the amount to which the, the secondary manufacturing and construction and the tertiary services sectors of the economy contribute into that is absolutely critical. The local housing economy provides a very strong sustainable market for locally manufactured goods and services, both of which currently are losing traction. And there is a definite need to start looking at how Uganda builds that local housing economy, because it is perhaps the most important market uh, for products developed in um, major parts of Uganda's uh, services and manufacturing sector. So that loss of competitiveness is worrying to us, and we see major opportunities for Uganda to grasp again the, the greater potential that is offered through being a regional and possibly more in the future an international exporter of housing goods and services. Housing costs can definitely be reduced through, through strategic interventions and improvements in the housing value chain. And there's no doubt that government can significantly benefit from a better functioning housing sector, not only through taxes and levies, but also through the general econ economic growth that housing stimulates that we spoke about at the beginning of the presentation. What we then do in the report is we look at six major uh, recommendation areas where Uganda can start looking at creating a much stronger housing economy. And what I want to do is just indicate that each of those relate to a specific component in this housing economic value chain um, in order that uh, perhaps the, the, the organizations and the people on the call can also start placing themselves in terms of the interventions where there are major opportunities for them to engage and support. So let's look at those six recommendation areas. We are saying that there is a strategy that is required of, around scaling and deepening affordable housing supply in Uganda. What we mean there is we need a much greater match between supply and demand. As demand deepens and improves, we, we need to make sure that we are producing many more, many more affordable and many different types of housing, specifically in the major urban center um, of Uganda. We need to ensure that there are alternatives to only conventional housing construction. There is no ways that conventional housing is, itself is going to resolve all of these issues. And we need to look at other opportunities of stimulating what the informal housing economy also does. We need to also make sure that we use Uganda's limited capital expenditure in the best possible way to stimulate that economy going forward. And as we saw in the cost benchmarking, we have a major job of work to do to continue to reduce the development cost of basic affordable houses so that, in fact, we can much deepen where those houses are able to impact on the housing pyramid. Strategy two is we need to strengthen the local development and construction capacity significantly. We firstly need to ensure that we regain stability and growth post COVID. One of the first industries to die is housing construction. Um, and housing rental has faced significant impact from, from COVID as well, specifically through non-paid rents, the loss of, uh, of service income and various other aspects. So we want to look at how we can assist uh, Ugandan decision makers to look at regrowing the power of housing construction and development, because we also know that for every rand spent on the construction of housing, two rand is developed 
in the, the upstream sectors of South Africa, or, sorry, of Uganda's economy. We then also need to make sure that we support the development and growth of the local construction sector. That's through the professionalization of developers and contractors. And it is also around the growth and, de and deepening of the, 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 um, the rental market and the real estate sector. So the certainty in the developer market is also absolutely critical here um, because basically investment money follows stability. And the sooner stability is returned, uh, the sooner developers and contractors will start to see the opportunities to develop housing in the Ugandan housing market. Strategy three is to build intermediate input capacity in the housing sector. This is about building a much stronger local building materials market capacity that not only better supports Uganda's own internal housing processes, but also assists to become a national and possibly even an international provider of housing inputs and services. And in addition to that, we need to also look at ensuring that there is a development of intermediate inputs overall in the economy. So one of the best things that can be done to improve housing is to improve the manufacturing sector. Um, and that would be a major area for, for general economic stimulation post COVID as well. Strategy four, to stimulate household effective demand for housing. I think it is, is quite clear that overall economic growth is the best housing stimulant. One of the first things that households spend on when their incomes grow is on improved housing circumstances. So we need to ensure that that is always top of mind in the housing strategy as well. And housing building economies also leads to econ economies continuing to build housing. The housing finance sector is absolutely critical. And the FSDU is doing some great work with many of the role players to improve uh, the operation of the mortgage market. There are significant uh, 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 events happening now and projects happening around um, small loans and microfinance. Um, AFD becoming involved there and various other actors starting to play in that market, which is excellent. But we must also not forget the need to ensure secondary mortgage markets, capital markets, construction finance markets, and even municipal finance markets are considered and strengthened in this process. We need to ensure that the rental market is grown as well and that the state engagement where it happens happens in a very, very um, deliberate way to stimulate the best possible economic outcomes. Strategy five is to improve program and project implementation and sector monitoring. You would have heard from CAF as well as from FSDU that information is the baseline for investment. And there is a need to continue to look at how we build those particular program and project uh, information bases in Uganda to improve and deepen them from their currently pretty good state from an African context. We then also need to make sure that we look at, um, uh, at, at building general investment parameters uh, and making sure that there is a solid uh, financial market to make sure that program and project implementation are able to secure the, the financial requirements that they, they need to make happen correctly. And then ultimately also, we uh, know that there are very few developers in Uganda who can do scale housing delivery. And there's a need to build the capacity of small, medium and large construction and development companies to be able to start producing thousands of houses on an annual basis, rather than hundreds of houses every now and then. And finally, strategy six, we need to look at improving the housing and real estate investment climate which is very much around ensuring those economic fundamentals keep on improving. Um, overall capital markets are deepened, that there is general deepening of uh, the work that happens in the investments in the investment area. And ultimately, Uganda needs to become competitive on a sub-regional context uh, to, to, to attract capital away, for instance, from Kenya. To who, to some extent, is ahead of Uganda in certain aspects of its economic fundamentals. Then finally, as a way forward, I just wanted to include by saying, how do we now build on what we know? And I wanted to propose five outlines. I know some of these topics will be picked up in the discussion uh, that I wanted to place on record going forward. So number one is to build statistics and information to continue with a con concerted effort to improve knowledge and information flows in the Ugandan economy. 
to improve their instruments where they exist and to look at new instruments to make sure we better understand the housing and real estate markets and we can start making informed decisions as policymakers, as NPOs, but most importantly, as investors. We want to uh, really encourage the co-design of strategies. And we already see a developing interest in combining uh, a future plan for Ugandan housing with the government of Uganda, FSDU, CAF, the World Bank Group, AFD, everyone is looking uh, at, at, at being engaged in the collaborative effort to make sure that this happens. Creating partnerships is next. Partnerships between government, NPOs and private sector. And then critical to this is also learning by doing, to find the collaborations that can then ensure that we can simply start implementing on scale uh, and making some mistakes and learning from those. And then ultimately to say that there is a major potential for housing in the COVID recovery process. And if this is mainstreamed, we believe that the partners on this call can make a significant impact in not only recovery from COVID, but ensuring housing uh, continues to become a significant sector in Uganda's economic growth. Thank you very much. The documents are up on the website and CAF has also produced a fantastic summary document uh, for those people who might not have uh, the full evening to contribute to my document. That will be a, a short half an hour of your time, which will give you a greater insight into what I presented. I thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, thank you for the very concise and informative presentation, which we look forward to unpacking further with our panel of industry leaders. And we have a very rich mix of sector actors represented on this call. So I want to welcome and encourage all of you to share any comments, thoughts, or questions in the chat box. Um, as we move into the panel discussion, we would recommend that you tag your questions to specific panelists. And thank you for the questions that have already come in. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over the call to my colleague, Jimmy Ebong, who's the FSD Uganda Research Specialist, and he will be coordinating the panel session where we are going to be hearing insights from these industry leaders based on their experiences creating an enabling environment for investment in affordable housing. In the case of the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Lands, their experiences innovating for the market in the case of the financial service providers who are represented here, and also the role of housing as a tool for building our economic resilience in the case of the Social Security Fund. So Jimmy, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, everyone. Um, and I would like to welcome you now to the next um, step in this uh, webinar where we would like to now, um, we would like to push further the webinar to the next level. And in this stage, we would like to bring the expertise and the experience of the industry actors to be able to illuminate uh, some of the issues that were emerging or the issues that emerged from uh, David's um, presentation. Um, I would like to highlight that David brought out uh, a number of issues which we are going to, to, to focus on a bit more in detail. A number of issues which are pertinent in the housing uh, financing in the, in the in housing sector of Uganda. Uh, these issues range from high level macroeconomic issues, which affect um, the flow of capital and therefore affordability of finance to the housing uh, sector. But also he did highlight the issues around the deficits in the housing units and the urban growth, if you may have heard, um, and, and uh, the picture is not that great, given the urbanization rates. So we see that uh, the trend in the construction of the units is not catching up with the rate of urbanization. Um, 
part of the challenges why the trend is not catching up with the rate of urbanization is coming from cost related issues. And I'm talking about the cost of construction of housing, uh, uh, which is high uh, for Uganda compared to a number of African countries, still developing countries. Um, and this high cost seems to affect affordability of uh, construction. And then he did also highlight the issues around the finance products, the, the products we have in the market for financing um, uh, housing and others. He went on to also, towards the end, he's talking about building on what you already know, issues around partnerships and others. So in this panel, we would like to discuss the aspect of bridging the gap in access to finance for affordable housing. And that is, as you may see uh, on your screens, that is the, uh, what the panel discussion is going to focus on. Um, I am very convinced that we have a very um, distinguished panel, as you can see on, on your screen, uh, who are going to, they will be able to, to bring to life some of the policy issues, policy related issues, as well as issues that we hear that are emerging from the supply side as well as demand side that relates to financing housing. At the end of this, we hope to identify what can be done. So I'm talking about actionable as well as uh, feasible steps towards bridging the gap in access to access, but also uptake of finance for affordable housing. So how can we bridge the gap that uh, is glaring at us as, as, a, as a stakeholders for this sector, this affordable housing uh, uh, sector? Um, I can see that we're already falling behind shadow. Um, I will ask my uh, panelists to try as much as possible to be uh, specific and straight to the point. Uh, having said this, I would like to uh, get, get us started, set the ball rolling, and uh, my first question uh, is going to the Commissioner of uh, Financial Services from the Ministry of Finance, Mr. Moses Ogwapus. And, and, and the question is this, um, first maybe you can reflect a bit on the presentation, some of the issues that are emerging, comment on the presentation but also highlights, as you comment, uh, the issues around the importance of the housing sector to Uganda's economy. And as you do that, please highlight, um, we see that in the financial sector development strategy, there is quite a strong focus on uh, housing financing, uh, increasing long-term finance for housing financing. Talk about that, highlight that uh, as well in your, in your comment. Thank you. Moses? Hello? Yes, please. Now we can hear you. Oh, you can now hear me. OK. Uh, good, yes. good afternoon, fellow participants. I'd like to appreciate um, FSDU and Rashmi for um, enabling this uh, webinar and uh, the research that has gone into this. Earlier on, I uh, Rashmi, you wanted me, wanted me to concur that we have such a good working relationships. I like to confirm that that is the case. Uh, in fact, it's not just good, it is very formal in form of uh, an MOU, which we both, I know, mutually want to, to honor and uh, implement as, as much as we, we can. Um, i like to let you know that I'm not alone. I, I decided to invite um, my colleagues in the department. Um, some of you, you know them, Mr. Golova, Mr. 
Mr. Kasenge and uh, Mr. Isabiri. They are officers in the financial services department. I thought it'd be very useful for them to, uh, to participate either by listening or contributing where need will arise. Uh, I, I like to appreciate the presentation. It was spot on. I was telling my colleagues that I wish we could uh, eventually, and Rashmi knows we can do this, probably get our leaders as well to listen or to, to, to have access to the research uh, which you have uh, brought on the table. I, in the interest of time, I am not going to repeat the issues that have been raised as far as the importance of the housing sector is concerned, its contribution to GDP and uh, its importance in the creation of uh, fixed assets and, and capital and the contribution to GDP, to revenue and social welfare and all those great, great points that were raised in the presentation. So I just want to acknowledge that, uh, that all, the, all that information is very uh, spot on and important for us to take on board as we do our budgets and, and strategies and plans uh, as government. Now, uh, moderator, you, you had uh, touched on the financial sector development strategy to the extent that um, it focuses on aspects of uh, increasing access to and use of finance, uh, strengthen financial markets and infrastructure, and strengthening financial integrity and stability in the financial sector. We believe that um, uh, these elements would be very critical in supporting uh, the, the construction, housing, and real estate uh, in the country. If we can work towards uh, realizing uh, these, these strategies and, and, and putting in place the necessary legislation and policy that we are in moment. Thank you, back to you. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you, uh, Moses. Um, I would like to pick on one of the other issues which was coming up from, from David's presentation. And that relates to the issue around the, the costs, the cost, of, uh, um, cost of construction. Uh, he did highlight that the number of uh, factors that drive the costs, the high costs that we see. Uh, one of them being the, the infrastructure costs, uh, stands at about 14%. We have um, overhead, overhead costs about 10%, compliance costs 7%, and even the, the cost for land contributing to about 5%. If you look at a key, uh, an issue like the the overhead costs at 10%, it does seem to highlight uh, the, the factoring in of uh, some risks, especially on the side of the property uh, developers. So um, implying that there are quite some inherent uh, risks uh, in uh, developing uh, properties. And so that's why the property developers factor in these, these costs. And so uh, I'm asking this question to um, to Irene, uh, Commissioner Housing Development from uh, Ministry of Lands, Housing and Urban Development. Um, you could highlight, Irene, uh, okay, comment as well on the presentation. Uh, take a few minutes to comment, but highlight as you comment uh, what probably the government is doing or the government intends to do. Uh, to, de to reduce these risks that we see, these risks that are inherent in the housing construction sector, such that uh, perhaps if these risks are reduced, we would then be able to unlock investments in the sector and uh, consequently uh, lead, would lead us to cheaper construction costs and then we'd see uh, people being able to afford uh, uh, housing. So please um, comment on the presentation and as, as well as highlight what uh, is being 
done or what is uh, is in the plan from the side of the ministry from the side of your ministry uh, thank you very much jimmy and uh, good evening to you all i also want to start by appreciating fsd and CAF for inviting the ministry to participate in this discussion and uh, thank you david the presentation was very insightful I generally also agree with the findings and recommendations of the, of the study because they strongly correlate with our observations as a ministry. The report has just helped to quantify and systematically break down the issues that are involved. Indeed, the, sec the state of the sector could be a huge opportunity if deliberately targeted, but also the reverse is true that if we if the status quo remains uh, it could turn into a crisis population increase the report puts it at third highest in the world and uh, we are creating new cities all these people have to be housed and we already have a backlog of two million units indeed there are several weak links across the housing value chain and uh, as a ministry, we can say we are registering some success in some areas, but a lot more needs to be done to achieve the objectives of the national housing policy. When it comes to the uh, question that you have posed about high cost of construction, and you, you have highlighted the different uh, key cost drivers, for example, infrastructure, high cost of land, compliance costs, and also we have uh, hindrances on the finance side with high interest rates, among others. So when, when we analyze each of these elements, for example, if we look at infrastructure, generally at national level, infrastructure development is high on government agenda, and there's a lot of uh, development going on in relation to primary infrastructure. But uh, the greatest role in extension of infrastructure the feeder roads that go to housing areas lies with the local government and municipalities. And the challenge that they have faced is uh, lack of funding to actually implement some of these projects. So ultimately the developer has to take on the responsibility of the infrastructure. And uh, of course they will factor that in the cost of the housing, which raises uh, the cost beyond uh, affordable levels to the majority. So uh, one of the areas that the ministry is uh, doing, uh, so one of the things that the ministry is doing to address this is to look at uh, revenue generation of the municipalities and local governments. And uh, we have an ongoing project, the Uganda Support to Municipal Infrastructure Development Program which is being implemented in uh, 22 municipalities across the country. And one of the areas is to build capacity in municipalities in generating revenue, in financial management, in uh, uh, creating a conducive environment for private sector investment, in procurement. We are also supporting them with uh, uh, several key infrastructure, for example, urban roads, transport terminals, markets, slaughterhouses, and beautification like uh, public parks. And uh, if you go to another area, for example, uh, land, of course, land, like any other commodity, responds to uh, forces of demand and supply. But uh, reforms that are being undertaken include uh, computerization of the land information system, and uh, we think uh, that once uh, the process is uh, fastened and uh, streamlined, it will also impact on the cost of uh, regulatory compliance. We have also uh, constructed ministry zonal offices across the country. Currently, there are 22 in uh, total to strategically uh, extend land services to the population. And this has uh, significantly accelerated. Yeah. Hello? Yes. Uh, and this has accelerated uh, property registration and titling process. 
The system integrates land registration, land administration, surveying and mapping, physical planning, valuation, land records, real estate taxation. So all these have contributed to reduction in the cost of uh, property uh, registration. Of course, uh, physical planning and zoning are key. And uh, we have already developed a, a national physical development plan to guide uh, development at national level. And the effort now is to support uh, municipalities, local governments in uh, fast tracking development of their own detailed physical development plans. Uh, quality of construction is also key. And um, the law governing the construction of buildings is now operational. This was 2018. We have a national building code that provides uh, mandatory construction specifications that, is the, uh, that ensure health, safety, and protection and environmental integrity of buildings. And uh, this will help to address the issue of substandard construction. And a lot is also being done to streamline the building plan approval process. Currently, it's also undergoing uh, computerization under the building information system. And this is also bound to go a long way in reducing costs uh, of uh, compliance and accelerating regulatory approvals. Now, another key aspect is regulation because the report has mentioned uh, the informality in the construction sector, uh, which is uh, totally true. And, uh, one of the key regulations that the ministry is working on in this regard is the real estate bill, which aims to regulate the real estate sector, to introduce uh, industry standards and improve efficiency. And this mainly pertains to real estate agents and developers who are currently unregulated. And uh, as a result, the market lacks uh, transparency uh, transaction prices and costs are sometimes uh, distorted or very high. And this has left the public prone to fraud, uh, dishonesty, uh, and sometimes uh, money laundering. So the regulation of the real estate sector will also improve the environment for investment uh, because it will help to safeguard property values and uh, also create uh, transparency in the market. Uh, the other one that we are focusing on is uh, private, uh, public private partnerships, sharing the risk between government and private sector, where government will take up some responsibility, for example, for the land, for uh, regulatory compliance, uh, supporting in uh, improving uh, profitability and affordability through subsidies and uh, taxes and the incentives under the Investment Code Act, the real estate sector is priority for investment and with that comes uh, incentives. So these are some of the ways that uh, we are trying to address uh, the challenge of uh, the high cost of construction. Uh, Mr. Jimmy, you're still muted. Sorry. Yes. So thank you very much, uh, Irene. I I know that there were some initiatives around the housing policy and physical planning, and uh, it did seem to have indicated um, construction of mass housing units uh, and opening up uh parts for home ownership so we'll explore that a little bit later i'll get back to you on that but one of the issues that came up from your response to the first question was that the aspect related to um the funding issues and the, you did mention the issues around insufficient funds but also the price for the costs for for the products eh, that are for financing housing um, I'm aware we have with the Housing Finance Bank home loans, 
and as well as mortgages and some credit facilities uh, that can also be applied or applicable in this context of uh, financing housing. And as well as we have some microfinance products, uh, especially with Pride, for instance, the housing loans. Um, I would like to take us uh, the next step, uh, next discussions around the, the, these products and um, cost associated to them, uptake, usage of these products and affordability issues. Um, and for that reason, I would like to direct my next question to a Housing Finance Bank, uh, Chief Executive Officer, uh, Michael Mugabe. Um, uh, so Michael, please um, comment on the presentation as well, but also we would like to know a bit more around the issues of um, these products that I have mentioned, um, um, the uptake of these products, um, how great ticket size of, of these home ownership products, is, if I may call them so, uh, some of the trends that you have seen in the recent past, uh, as well as, um, yeah, the affordability issues. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. I hope you can all hear me. And uh, a big thank you to Rashmi and the team at Financial Sector Deepening for coordinating this uh, very key, key, key webinar. Uh, a big thank you to David for the very insightful report uh, with very keen insights that are definitely uh, of great value. And I believe that will greatly enhance our journey of transforming this very key sector in the economy. I, I want to begin by uh, reacting to, or just giving two comments to, to Deb's presentation uh, in terms of the housing economic value chain and how and the whole aspect that he presented. And I'll, I'll, I'll restrict my uh, reaction to just two, two areas. One is the um, aspect of the informal and the informal real estate. I think for me, it was exciting and uh, quite revealing for us to note that um, we've seen commendable or, or very phenomenal growth of the informal real estate. Well, the formal, remains a mega 2% and the informal aspect, informal real estate being about 95%. And, and if the research as a whole in Uganda is almost entirely informal, because 98% is, is about it all. Then for me and the team, the rest of the team here in the countries, how do we then, first and foremost, how do we then draw this largely informal activity into, how do we draw them closer the formal setting to be able to optimize and maximize the sector's contribution, but also improve the access to, to policy consideration. Because it's, it's in there that we're able to tap and gain more and, and see how we, we, we then support it better. As a bank, I must say that we recognize that uh, there's a lot of opportunity in this whole space. And that's why we've um, come up with products that speak to that uh, uh, housing, the informal real estate. We've seen phenomenal growth. So for me, this attests to the findings that, that that sector has been growing in a, at a very phenomenal phase and, and we need to see how we tap in and how we draw them closer that we can support them better, support the sector better and see how to harness and leverage on this already, you know, emerging growth to do much more uh, change. Uh, the other key area I wanted to comment on is costs. Costs, I think, which uh, uh, my colleague Irene Gochala also spoke to. Uh, uh, and, 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 and it was from the benchmarking, which I think is also very, very insightful. Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, uh, and, 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 and South Africa. Uh, and we find that if the average cost of construction um, is about 50%, it, 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 construction contributes about 50%, and the rest of it, uh, the other peripheral issues, then I think the key challenge for us, if we are going to address affordability, then we need to address, we need to focus on those aspects, the other 50% in terms of aspects of infrastructure, and we know that infrastructure costs about 30% of housing. How do we address that? I think government needs to come in here strongly to see how we open up new areas and cut, but also compliance, 7%. The overheads, how do we then work to address that aspect? Because I think for me, that's where the key uh, challenge is for us. 
we cannot continue to speak of, of affordability if we left this area unattended to. Cognizant of the fact that the actual construction, the real construction to housing is about 50%. I think, I think for me, there lies our challenge and there lies our work and task ahead for us as we continue to discuss and change uh, the dynamics of this whole industry and sector. So for me, those were the key pivotal things I needed us to, to address. And uh, I'll then move on, Jimmy, to your, to your question in terms of uptake uh, uh, and, and average. First, first, I want to again thank you for organizing this important engagement at a time when investments in the housing sector are increasing and becoming critical, uh, especially with the growth in the urbanization rates in the country, and not just Uganda, but across the globe. Uh, and indeed, we've worked over the last 50 years as a bank to reshape the landscape. We've also reposition the bank to offer a few suite of banking services that for me speak primarily to the housing financing needs of individuals and businesses, but also the personal customer and business entrepreneurs. So uh, uh, customers are drawn from sectors of the economy and that's include formal and the informal sectors, formal market segments. Therefore, if you talk of the professionals, the doctors, the lawyers, the accountants, the bankers, the we, they are well taken, but also we've moved in to see how do we tackle the informal sector, the taxi drivers, the farmers, the traders, uh, the customers in all the public, in the micro and SME segments. I think which is for me a very big area you know, for us. So how do we do this? So over the years, we've witnessed uh, shifting trends in the, um, you know, offering, in offering in terms of, uh, of, of, uh, of the size of, uh, ticket size of home loans. And, um, and, and for me, first and foremost, I'd like to align this change in the average ticket size of a loan uh, with, with the growth of the economy alongside the urbanization levels. Coming off an epoch, epoch of political instability, we, the 1990s saw an average home ownership size gradually increase from about $20,000, and that's about 73 million shillings. So about $80,000, that's close to about 300 million shillings. And this was up until about 2000, and over the last seven years, we've seen that, that, that go down. We've seen an, a sharp reduction in the average ticket size to about $40,000. Uh, but this has also come with an increase in the number of prospective first-time homeowners. homeowners. So, so the last period spanning to close, close 10 years has witnessed growth in the country's service sector. Uh, and that means um, incomes, in the hands in various households be able to service and this kind of loans. And this has come along with the need to provide housing for the growing middle class. So, so the new peri-urban residential areas have emerged rapidly along with mid-sized housing developers delivering relatively less costly housing units to beat down housing prices. So we've seen a number of uh, developers coming on the market to try and uh, address that aspect of, of, of affordable housing, but not quite closing the issue. We've also seen government's deliberate effort in improving the road networks, and I think um, um, my other panelists spoke to that. Improving the road network outside of the main urban centers, and this has increased accessibility to the former less settled areas for the urban working population. So land costs, infrastructure, uh, compliance costs are tend to be relatively lower away from the main city up and leading to an observed trend in the average. And that's why we see the ticket size of the loan slightly reducing from what it was uh, over 10 years ago. So, so, so with this, this happening and, 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 and this, 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 this kind of change, the economy, the growth has all been able to cause a shift in, in terms of um, of the kind of products of what brought the market, we've seen uh, uh, loans coming in, all aimed at trying to feed into housing, housing, and that has been for me a big change for us as a sector. So all key players coming in, in tandem with evolving economic trends to be able to see how we close the gaps in, uh, and, uh, and address the, the, the changing patterns for housing in this country. So uh, I, I think for now, that's what I can say. So we hope we continue to see maybe the other aspect is, uh, is, um, is uh, no, no, I think that, that that's about it, uh, Jimmy, for me. Okay. Um, thank you very much for, for those. Um, 
we have, as I mentioned a little earlier, the other market, um, which is being financed by microfinance, microfinance products. Uh, and so my next question will go to um, Pride Microfinance Limited and to the executive director, Edward. Uh, comment a bit, Edward, on the presentation, but again, also highlight, um, we, we are very interested to know who exactly are you targeting with this uh, microfinance uh, housing loan product? Um, and what are some of those structural issues? It could be demand related, but also on the supply side of, of these funds. Uh, what are some of those issues uh, that you, you, you face on a daily basis, which affects perhaps how, affects uptake and usage of this uh, housing microfinance product, this housing loan? You're welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, I, want, I, want, I want to add my voice to the previous uh, speakers and thank David for such a, a lovely and a well thought out presentation, but also thank FSDU and CAF uh, for putting this together. Uh, very insightful and uh, gives a lot of uh, information that we shall be using along the way. There are quite a number of things that we pick uh, from the presentation. The number of slides that are where we've taken a lot of interest. Uh, one, uh, the issue of uh, the input in the construction sector. You know, we all tend to think that construction, uh, the biggest cost or all the cost is about the money that goes into putting up uh, something, uh, a construction, but uh, there are many things around the value chain that come with the construction, uh, like David has said, the land, uh, the infrastructure, compliance, and other costs. And, and, and indeed, as when you're analyzing these uh, uh, clients or people to take up uh, facilities for construction of our home improvement loan, we call it home improvement loan, because uh, the way we structure it is in such a way that being this being a micro uh, sector, there is, we, we do not necessarily have to provide the facility in one go, but uh, people come in and take loans uh, to do one thing at a time. And that's why this, this, this slide is very important for us because somebody might come in and requires uh, money to, to, to acquire the land. Another person is constructing, but he's starting with putting up, say, uh, the basic uh, structure. Uh, and you know, in Uganda, uh, there are many people uh, who will put up a structure, roof it, and get to enter that structure. Then they get to finish uh, along the way. But in terms of targeting, whom do we target? You know, the, the, in microfinance, we, we have something called bottom of the pyramid. Uh, the people below uh, the pyramid who are precisely or not necessarily served by the mainstream financial institutions. And those are the banks. Uh, th these are micro, and the word micro or small or medium might vary from, 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 from institution to institution. But we are looking at people who are going to take relatively low amounts of money uh, in the ranges of 3 million, 10 million, uh, 20 million, maybe up to about 50 uh, or even 100. But uh, on average, you're looking at uh, uh, loans of 5 million. And, and, and these monies are used, say, for painting, for buying uh, iron sheets uh, to put up the roof, for buying bricks. And, and remember, we talk about bricks. We are talking about our local bricks, uh, possibly not even clay, but somebody wants to put up a building, uh, like, like you saw in figure 25 from David's presentation. We had those comparative unit costs for the six housing technologies, and the lowest being 177. But these houses can even be much, much lower. So we target those people who require not so big amounts of money 
but at the same time, they want to afford some housing facility. Uh, two rooms, three rooms, or even a full house, but they are doing it incrementally. Uh, they, they are not going to do the whole project at once. Or if they are going to do the whole project, then they have their own resources on the side. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a question about the structural issues uh, that has been up, put across to me. Uh, and indeed, these are many. Uh, one, and very important to us, uh, is, is around the land tenure. Um, and, and you know this, uh, this faces challenges, especially in the Northern region, but also here, where people do not have land titles, where people do not have uh, certificates of title, they can't present anything in terms of ownership. What is there to show that they own, they own the land? So the question is, as an institution, how do you go about supporting that kind of client? Who wants to own a dwelling? Who wants to own a house? But at the same time, cannot prove that the land where I am is mine. So that becomes a very big structural issue to us. And uh, at times, it, it, it has worked against our clients, but also worked against us. But we see ways and means of how we go about it. It is just of recent that the automation of the land registry uh, has come up. It is a, a new development. And the teething problem here exists around the verification process. Uh, and, and, and very importantly, we are thinking, and this may be is thrown to the, to the housing sector and, and the ministry there, the Ministry of Lands, Housing and Urban Development. How do we integrate the systems in lands with the financial institutions. Uh, these days, the banks are talking about integrating NIRA and NITA, the database uh, with, the, with the, the financial institutions. How can we integrate uh, the lands process, the system in lands with uh, the financial institutions such that if I'm going to verify or to do a due diligence on, 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 on somebody who wants a loan and maybe they are using their land title or anything like that, I can easily get information. And the throughput period, the period that is going to take the client to access this loan is shortened and business and business moves. The, the other key thing is about standardization of services, which often causes problems for financials. Uh, you know, just consider a borrower who gets up standard services, you know, they have no incentive to repay their loan. But if we can standardize our processes, we can standardize our services in the, in the, in the industry and, and get to appreciate how things are done. Uh, structurally, you know that Minister of Finance is doing this. Minister of Lands is, is, is in charge of this. Uh, the financials are in charge of this and then you bring in the customer. So along the way, standardizing, so such that when you get a person and you say, go to Wakiso, go to Mukono, go to this land's office, they know exactly what they are going to pick uh, as opposed to moving uh, different uh, places. And very importantly is the issue of fraud. Uh, I think I had, I had Irene, Madame Irene Gocha talk about it. Uh, fraud is still rife and, 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 and is such an existential problem that we have to curb together. Uh, and it even gets worse with our small, small borrowers people who do not necessarily have uh, places to, 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 to stay and you cannot, you cannot place them to particular locations. So it goes a long way to, 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 to do the due diligence and, and verify uh, whatever they are presenting, the information they are giving you to know that you'll be, you'll be supporting them. But anyway, with that, uh, you know, these are the risks in the, in the, in the industry as, um, as we manage the housing sector. But we've tried and, uh, and we've moved. Uh, the product is growing uh, in, in the organization. And we are sure that uh, this is the way to go. With the finances, you know, the other thing that we have as a challenge is, uh, you know, financing. Uh, we, use, we mainly use the internal resources that we have and built over time. But if we got an opportunity to have a financer, the way it is in agriculture today, 
A number of institutions have gone into agriculture. EIB is in agriculture, UDB is in agriculture, EADB is in agriculture. They are giving you facilities at relatively subsidized rates to, to, to lend to agricultural people. The question is, what happens to the housing finance uh, industry? Can we get those resources at subsidized rates? And then we extend the same uh, to the persons on the ground. Uh, briefly, that's what I can comment on that question. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Edward. Uh, those are very insightful uh, inputs. Um, I have among my panelists, um, Matthew, who is a real estate analyst with National Social Security Fund, NSSF. I think that we are missing something, uh, at least from the perspective of, if you look at housing, it's, um, the, the, the issues around uh, asset creation and resilience, but also the issue around a number of us who every month are depositing something with, 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 with NSSF. And so we would like to, to know, um, uh, Matthew, uh, from you, the question around, I know housing is among uh, a portfolio of projects that you, you're dealing with, but so you have a challenge around, um, you need to grow the fund. Uh, at the same time, you're also thinking about securing features of your members, helping them acquire long-term assets. Uh, that's 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 one aspect, but the other issue is around. So, what is the fund doing to enhance long-term wealth creation? The issues around resilience. So, if you would be able to co uh, comment on these two aspects, plus any additional issue comment that you will be having on the on David's presentation, uh, this is the opportunity for you. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. All right. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, yeah. Uh, David, uh, thanks for your presentation. I echo my uh, colleague's sentiments uh, regarding how insightful it was. Now, um, I especially agree with the few, okay, most of the points you made, but uh, these, these, these are the ones that stood out to me. The, um, the aspect of housing being a critical element to the recovery of economies, I am in total agreement. Um, and then another aspect that we keep forgetting that uh, you effectively said we are still a rural economy, right? 75% of households are in the, in the rural space and 25% in the urban space. Uh, you, you highlighted the, the, the growing urbanization, uh, which should be cause for concern for all of us uh, and the need for, for, for decent housing in that space. 11% uh, contribution to GDP, housing construction, the real estate space. That's, 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 uh, that's significant. That can't be ignored. Um, another aspect of your presentation that, that um, effectively ties directly to what we do is, is, this, is the fact that we are getting progressively less competitive on the world market and as far as building materials is concerned. And that's, that's a concern on our part. We have, we have a negative trade balance for building materials. So construction costs uh, are getting higher and higher. Now, just to give those that have, um, I'm sure most people in this panel uh, aware of, of uh, NSSF and what we do, but for the benefit of those that do not, allow me to give some context while I, I address the, the two questions that have been highlighted. So the fund is the National Social Security Fund, it's set up an act of parliament that mandates, uh, whose mandate it is to collect 15% of employees' gross salary from the private sector. Okay, this should be noted that we have our membership isn't doesn't have any public servants. Okay, our membership is entirely private sector. So you have your, your banks, your your private businesses with employees of five and over. You have uh, secondary school, primary school teachers. So our mandate is to collect fifteen percent, five from the employee's salary, and a ten percent contribution from the employer and then prudently invest that money. And, and, and at the end of, of a 20, 25 year working life, 
present that money in a lump sum to the to a qualifying uh, exiting member, right? So currently, our membership stands at 1.34 million members. Okay, and of the 1.34 million members, 600,000 members are considered active, active members. And an active member is defined as a member who has contributed at least once within the last year. Now, if we were strict in that definition of active member and said, okay, what about the people who have contributed in the last three months? Those would only be 350,000 members, right? Now, the average balances just for, again, this is just for context, right? The average balances of these 600,000 active members are, are such that 31% of them have less than a million shillings total balance. 43% are between 1 million Uganda shillings and 10 million Uganda shillings. So that is 70% with less than 10 million shillings in total savings, the life of, of their membership. 18% between 10 million and 50 million and only 7% above 50 million shillings total balance. But I feel that the, 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 the next statistic is a bit more telling that 75% of the 600,000 members make less than 650,000 Uganda shillings in gross income per month. The average gross income is 350,000 Uganda shillings. That should give you insight into our average member, right? Our average member is that Kakira Sugar Works Out Grower. It's that math primary school teacher in Arua. It's that uh, science teacher in, in, in somewhere in a rural space. That is our average member. That is who we owe a fiduciary duty to. So then what is our mandate as the management or as, as custodians, as trustees of, of, this, of this pension money that is being collected and invested? Our mandate is to ensure that we invest these monies prudently and guided by a policy that whose primary mandate is, is preservation of capital and the real growth of that capital. So currently our total portfolio stands at 13.7 trillion Uganda shillings. So that's about $3.5 billion with 78% of that money in, in a fixed income asset class. So the fixed income asset class is considered the lowest risk bucket and 13.7% in the equities asset class. These are shares in listed companies and then 7.4% in real estate. So, and as far as absolute numbers are concerned, that's 10 trillion in, in, in fixed income government paper across the, the East African region, 1.8 trillion in, in listed assets, uh, in listed companies, and 1 trillion in real estate. So considering this is a, a discussion on, on, on real estate and what we're doing in the space, this is how our 1 trillion is currently broken down. Currently 75% of this 1 trillion is still undeveloped land. Right, approximately 2,000 acres of land across the country ripe for development. Actually, the bulk of it is, is within Kampala and Greater Kampala. And 25% is developed, primarily commercial buildings. So you have your workers house, your social security house, that, that's just 25%. 75% is still, is still being held for capital appreciation, but also ideal for uh, uh, development, right? Now, our real estate strategy is such that we play in the space as developer. So your mandate is to invest people's savings and you do this through a strategic asset allocation that, 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 that meets the objectives of capital preservation and, and growth, right? So your, your strategic asset allocation is such that approximately 70% should be in fixed income bucket, 22% in the equities bucket and about 7.5% the real estate market. So while playing in the real estate space, we act as developer for, for right now for residential build for properties, um, our, our strategy is to build and then sell. And for commercial properties, our strategy is to build, hold for capital appreciation and, and rent, right? So in, in, the, in the locations we have built and sold currently uh, for residential properties, uh, our current live project that we have just completed is, is a 40 apartment unit uh, 
40 units in, 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 the, Mbuya, in the Mbuya area. We're currently developing 306 units in Lwar, about 50 acres of the 600 acres that we own in Lwar. We're currently developing 150 units in Chanja through our offtake project. Uh, we're currently designing 550 units that are going to be put up in Temangalo, right? Now, how, how we decide on what kind of products to put in what location is a function of, of the highest and best use for that location. Since our primary mandate to that Kakira Sugar Wax grower is to ensure that one, we don't waste or lose his, his capital saved, and two, that we grow it in a real manner. Um, we In every location that we have developed or, or, or developing a concept, the basis is what's the highest and best use for this particular location so that our, our chance, our probability of success and for profit is maximized, right? So in the real estate space, we're contributing to the supply of housing by, by developing buy and sell, by developing commercial properties to hold. But then we have, we're also considering we're a, a, a major stakeholder in the space. We are cognizant of the need for slightly more affordable products. Now, different panelists and, and, and contributors of this, to this webinar have, have, have highlighted the, 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 and David himself highlighted the very expensive uh, cost of construction that it, it, it's, it's it almost, not almost, actually there is a, in, in this country, there is a diseconomies of scale that on a per square unit basis, you actually at a disadvantage if you develop 300 units as opposed to one bungalow. Because if you develop 300 units as, as is the case in the war, you're going, to, you're going to have the burden of building three kilometers of road. You're gonna have the burden of building uh, a, a wastewater treatment facility, okay? You're gonna have the, the, the burden of bringing bulk power. So all these that would otherwise have been taken care of by one government entity or another, you incur that infrastructure cost. That infrastructure cost has to be, has to be effectively uh, priced into the final price for the, for, the, for, the, for the consumer, which then makes uh, affordable housing such a, such a difficult challenge. So then, but what are we doing in this space? The off-taker project that we are currently undertaking in Chanja effectively says to private developers out there that, I will guarantee 100% offtake of your product. If your product is within certain minimum specs of distance, of quality, of size. Now this should take out the market risk on his, from, his, from his balance sheet, it should, from his perspective, it should take out the, uh, it, it should reduce his financing costs. If he takes that guarantee to the bank and says, okay, so uh, national housing, no, sorry, uh, NSSF is going to take 100% of my product upon completion. So my, my lending rates should be reduced. So that would reduce his, his, and his market risk. So he didn't have to price in the time value of money. He didn't have to price in the fact that he would otherwise have sold the units over a three, four, five year period. Uh, the bank will lend him at favorable rates uh, and, and then he's in and out. So the, the hope was that this would increase turnover of projects in the space hope is that it would reduce his cost of financing and if it reduces takes out much of his risk then even his developer profit required would reduce so that the final price to the consumer is less than what it otherwise would have been so we're currently about four five six months away from completion of that pilot project if it's successful we would then roll out uh, another offtake two where we invite private developers to to, to, to partake the, the hope is that it would, it would help them streamline their processes and they'd be more efficient and, and then eventually achieve the dream of, of slightly more affordable units. We are about to roll out, uh, we, we're working on a concept known as rent to own, which effectively would give consumers the opportunity to, 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 to rent one of our projects for a period of time while accruing equity in it and eventually own it. Uh, the concept was approved by the board, so we're working on, on other aspects of it. 
uh, that that should also aid on the demand side of things. Okay, if, if mortgage rates are in the late teens, that that might be too, too high for most consumers. We we're also using our clouds to explore different housing technologies, but obviously uh, the, the, the the market hasn't completely warmed up to the idea of, of anything other than brick and mortar. So that's, that's going to be slow. We're not going to be a fast mover in that space because again, our, we, can't, we can't have a white elephant scenario, right? So, but we're exploring uh, different housing technologies. We, we, we are constantly meeting and engaging with people that, that are looking to set up uh, factories here, but they want a guarantee that a thousand units will be built or such and such. But also we are running campaigns in the financial literacy space because the study was done and, and we discovered that 80% of our members that took their money uh, after two years, it, it, no tangible evidence of that money was seen. And 56% and of these people get advice from a member of their household or their relative. But even more telling is that 90% of these people had only had NSSF as their only saving scheme. So we felt that we had a, a, a moral obligation to educate, to, to have a financial literacy campaign and, and educate those who are getting their, their, their lump sum payment at 55 to, to effectively plan and manage it better, to, 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 to educate members who are 10, 15 years from retirement on, on, on on the benefits of saving and, and things of that nature. Um, so yes, so we're doing our part in, in, in building the economy. Uh, David mentioned that strategy four is to stimulate household effective demand for housing. And the best way to do that is to effectively do your part so, in, so, in, in building the economy to find a prudent investment uh, strategy. So that, that's, that's my explanation. So Matthew, I think that um... There's quite a lot happening at uh, NSSF. Um, perhaps we need to find additional time um, and explore these issues further. But I would like to thank you so much for your contributions. Um, we are run, running behind schedule and I, I, I would like to ask just one follow-up question. And then I will come back to everyone in the panel uh, regarding what then should be the way forward um, in light of all these issues that we have discussed, that we have raised. Um, so that one question, I remember I said I'll get back to Commissioner Housing Development, Irene, uh, relating to, and it, it relates to exactly what uh, Matthew uh, uh, was talking about, the aspect of home ownership, building houses, building homes at scale, right? For those who need them. Uh, I, I think that I read somewhere something that the Ministry of Housing was planning, or maybe it's already doing something around mass housing units and opening up uh, opportunities for home ownership um, for many who I believe are uh, of the low income category, so affordable housing. Any, any comments on this? Um, what is the ministry doing around around that that area of mass house ownership or mass home construction? Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, moderator. The national housing policy uh, specifies several types of housing to be delivered uh, through public private partnership. For example, we have uh, workers housing, we have rental housing slum redevelopment and housing for public servants and social housing, including others. There are about uh, 10 programs. Now, uh, we have just concluded our planning and budgeting for the NDP three period, which runs from 2021 to 2025. And really the focus as a sector has been to put together a comprehensive affordable housing program that incorporates uh, supply side, demand side, and enabling environment interventions, which will support efficient and effective housing delivery. 
Now on the supply side intervention, some of the activities that we have uh, embarked on, one is the mobilization of land. Because in a, in a public private situa uh, situation, uh, government will have to provide the land to subsidize the cost of housing. So we have embarked on mobilization of land uh, with priority to the new cities that have been created to get ready for this cooperation with the private sector. We have uh, also prioritized putting in place a public private partnership framework that uh, every developer that comes to government on a project will know exactly what to uh, expect. We have seen what is being done in other countries like, like Kenya, uh, where there is a standard rule of uh, 70 to 30%. Government will provide the land. 70% uh, can be uh, for middle income or high rise, but 30% 30, 30 specifically has to be for social housing. So we are exploring uh, such interventions. And then uh, we have a proposal for a housing research and technology center. And uh, from NSSF, we have heard they're exploring on uh, alternative technologies. And we know from our experience that this can really help to reduce the cost of housing. But as government, we, we cannot promote a technology that has not been uh, gone through a verification process. So uh, some of these interventions will help uh, to reduce housing and to specifically focus on affordability. Now, on the demand side, one of our key uh, projects that we are planning is uh, establishment of a mortgage liquidity facility in Uganda because uh, financial institutions uh, have expressed the need for long-term liquidity in the market and it's currently not available. So what this institution does is to mobilize uh, affordable finance from the banks themselves, from uh, development partners, from government itself. And these funds, uh, these funds can then be on lent at affordable rates to the population. What we see is that uh, this intervention will be very key in uh, improving uh, uh, mortgage rates, especially the terms and uh, the interest rate. Uh, we have seen that it has helped economies such as uh, Tanzania, Egypt, and uh, Malaysia. Uh, Rwanda recently established one, and Kenya also established one. So this is something that uh, we feel can help the economy in Uganda. We already conducted the feasibility study that found it viable. We have a project proposal that we are presenting uh, to Ministry of Finance, and we hope that uh, they will support the intervention. And this project uh, specifically looks at uh, funding for mortgages, but also looks at funding for microfinance institutions. Another uh, aspect of the project is that uh, capacity building is key, especially in the microfinance uh, space to help banks in targeting and uh, coming up with mortgage products for the low income space. Now, the other interventions that we have is uh, we uh, train communities in uh, forming circles and uh, cooperatives. And this is also targeted for slum dwellers for the low income population because we have found that they are good at saving. Once you organize a group, whether they are saving at 10,000 a day or 1,000, they will save. And as a ministry, we support them along the way. Once they save enough money, they can buy land. Once they, are, they get to the stage of construction, we can provide technical support in terms of uh, design and uh, construction supervision. Now, uh, we are also looking at uh, partners to help us within the sector. We have already had an engagement uh, with Shelter Freak. Uh, Uganda is a member of uh, Shelter Freak that uh, mobilizes finance and also uh, supports African governments in real estate development. And we have uh, a, a project that we are discussing, a public-private partnership 
of at least a thousand units and affordability and uh, targeting of low income is also key in uh, these projects. Of course, uh, we are looking at other areas, uh, the enabling framework that is going to make this happen. We have uh, the National Housing Corporation, a government corporation that was created to uh, construct affordable housing. And we would like to uh, develop a mechanism mm -hmm. in which they can refocus back to the affordable housing agenda. The others are to capitalize housing finance bank. Uh, government has done this uh, several times just to avail that funding uh, necessary for, for mortgages. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, sorry, madam, I will have to uh, come in a bit because I think you're talking about very interesting issues and that ties very well with what then should be um, where we are going in as far as this webinar is concerned. I remember where we're coming from. I did mention that towards the end, we would like to be able to identify actionable or feasible steps towards bridging the gap in access and uptake of uh, finance, but also we can include there that ultimately because we want to have um, as many people as possible, especially the low income category, urban dwellers be able to afford uh, housing. Um, I would like us to go along that line where you have already uh, gone into, you've led us there. I would like us to, I still had a few questions for some panelists, but I see the time is running out, it's already six. I would like us to tie this up, especially, I think we wouldn't have done enough justice to this discussion if we don't talk about what can be done? What actionable physical steps are we looking at here? I think that's where we should uh, direct the discussion. And I would just love to ask or to hear from each of my panelists uh, to start with the Ministry of Finance. Uh, Commissioner, we're coming back to you again, um, basically to tie it up in form of, uh, let me put it like, what should we do? What can be done? What partnerships? Uh, should be there, what kind of coordination is necessary to be able to uh, bring, we're talking about, uh, you mentioned the strategy from the beginning, there must be some issues there in the strategy that would require partnerships to implement, but also the issues about the, 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 the law, the, the deficits in the, in the units. So what can be done along that line to be able to uh, drive upwards um more constructions affordability and constructions of housing so in that uh, two questions give your recommendation and then we go back to to commissioner um irene again for also her recommendations and then we that's uh, we'll be headed towards wrapping up this webinar uh moses uh, we are with you uh thank you very much i like to uh appreciate all the interventions from the panelists, from uh, the colleagues from National House, from Housing Finance, from Pride Micro, Pride Microfinance, from the colleagues from the Minister of Lands and the NSSF. I think all the issues that they have raised are pertinent. And I like to emphasize that um, uh, and appreciate the fact that the, the operations in the government uh, so interlinked. Uh, therefore, it's very important that we have a coordinated approach. Um, specifically on the financial uh, financial sector and the, the financial services department, and, it, and indeed the Ministry of Finance, um, the two key areas I'd like to point out one is um, the issue of uh, informality. And uh, so I think we need to, to, to work together to, uh, to develop strategies to, uh, to create incentives to, uh, to get uh, the, the actors in the, the entire housing value chain to, 
into a more formal engagement. Um, and, and this has a, a wide scope uh, and you, you can probably talk about um, uh, regulations, um, the legal framework I, I, and, and planning and so on and so forth. But we can work out the details to deal with the issue of uh, informality and having um, a well-planned and structured housing and settlement plan. Uh, the second issue uh, is the cost of credit. Uh, and um, I mean, cost of credit, the interest rates are very high. Uh, we can't run away from that. And secondly, the, the products available in the financial sector are few or narrow. And, and then thirdly, uh, we also acknowledge that um, uh, the, the terms for lending are also not attractive. Most of them are short term. So we don't have good long-term credit facilities um, in the sector. Uh, so we think that um, the, the opportunities for us to work with all the, the stakeholders here to, to respond to these issues. And you'll appreciate that uh, if you take the case of um, uh, cost of credit, uh, they are the causes are outside the financial sector. I mean, we are having discussions at Uganda Bankers Association, and I think FSDU, you've been part of the discussion. These are things to do with the land registry, things to do with the, the, the dis dispute resolution, the, the cost of um, uh, litigation, and the, the time it takes to deal with, to resolve matters in court, things to do with the police. Uh, so it's a wide scope of things which uh, are outside the, directly the financial sector. It's things to do with the, the, probably the tax regime uh, in, in some aspects. Uh, uh, we are uh, working on a study with the stakeholders to, to respond to this particular issue. And uh, I think uh, I will also recall that uh, the ministry through a, a program, uh, SEDEP, I think this should be familiar to most of us here, has been very instrumental in, um, in addressing the issues of competitiveness, the, the land registry, uh, modernizing and uh, digitizing the land registry, as well as um, uh, supporting Uganda Registration Services Bureau to, uh, to, to modernize and make their their processes more efficient. There is an issue which was raised by the colleague from uh, LANS, the commissioner from LANS. I, I like to appreciate your a very elaborate presentation about the mortgage, mortgage finance facility. Uh, I think on our part, we are working with the central bank to make sure that we have uh, the necessary legislation to support, support you and, uh, and also to to mobilize other stakeholders to be able to, uh, to bring on board this product. Uh, and this is where I believe um, the stakeholders on this forum could um, uh, also have a hand, especially FSDU, you've been very instrumental in supporting uh, us in developing the right uh, legislation uh, you know, in the financial sector. So I think this is where we can work with you. And finally, I think uh, uh, generally, I think it would be very useful to, uh, to, to develop a plan on conscientizing uh, the people involved in planning and management so that we have a well-coordinated um, plan to, 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 to develop the, uh, the housing infrastructure in the country. Thank you. I'll leave it, leave it at that for now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so, so uh, Commissioner Irene, I, I'm getting back to you, picking on to, on from rather, sorry, uh, where we, you were talking about the proposal to Ministry of Finance, and you did mention is, sorry, issues of partnerships. Uh, and I'm also hearing uh, issues of coordination uh, coming in here. 
So in a, in a, in a few minutes, uh, please proceed then to where I stopped you. I think at some point you are giving more or less like recommendations ready uh, of what can be done to bring the costs down, cost for housing uh, construction, making it affordable. Um, yeah, so please uh, go ahead in the next um, um, a few minutes, try to summarize. Okay, um, in summary, uh, I would like to say that um, in another study that was conducted, um, it was discovered that 60% uh, of the housing deficit is for low income housing. So attention needs to be uh, paid on uh, social housing. Now we have had uh, challenges uh, sometimes with our projects, especially with the uh, Ministry of, of Finance, with uh, housing uh, being viewed uh, only as a social infrastructure. But uh, I would like to uh, defer and uh, probably um, request uh, my colleague in finance to uh, really help us in support of uh, housing projects because housing is also economic infrastructure, just like uh, the study has shown. It, it has uh, very critical multiplier effects that can help uh, improve the economy and also drive the country to middle income status. The policy position is that um, government will provide a conducive environment to stimulate housing uh, production. Now, defining that stimulating environment, enabling environment for housing sector has been a challenge. Eh? And uh, lobbying for subsidies, uh, incentives, even within a project perspective has been a challenge. But I think uh, right now we cannot uh, avoid the problem because uh, it's growing worse day after day. And uh, the sector has a very big potential of contributing to the economy. So it should also be prioritized. And the policy position is also that uh, government will participate directly into housing production for specific categories of people. Sometimes when we uh, present projects uh, to finance, the bottom line is government does not finance housing or government does not build housing. And the policy position is different. And I would like to request uh, my colleague in Ministry of Finance to support us in uh, understanding of uh, housing, just like the report has highlighted, and in pushing recommendations that will help improve the housing situation in the country. At the moment, we need housing at scale. It cannot be project by project. It has to be scalable, just that uh, the report has shown. We are looking at uh, mass housing, a thousand units or more. We are looking at uh, improving developer capacity and the government will have to put in more in terms of creating that enabling environment and the public-private partnership framework, uh, in terms of subsidies, incentives, because on the one side, government wants to provide housing to the population, but the private party expects a profit. So we have to balance expectations on both sides. Now, in uh, conclusion, um, you asked about uh, the coordination of uh, uh, the housing program and indeed coordination is a very big part uh, of housing since it's multi-sectoral in nature you have to coordinate uh, government agencies across local government across utility providers across uh, our own national housing then you also have to look at the private sector development pa uh, partners financiers civil service society so the scope of uh, stakeholders is very wise. And um, I would like to say that this new uh, program-based budgeting and implementation of government programs, I think will uh, support us as a sector because uh, under this new program, 
all uh, government entities that have a role to play in a certain objective are placed under one program. Our program is uh, sustainable urbanization and housing. So it is anchored on leveraging urbanization for economic growth. Within this framework, we have had several challenges with mobilizing all these different partners. Uh, you prioritize a project, but the utility provider hasn't put it in, into their budget. We are hoping that under this framework, we shall all be able to move together with our stakeholders. All those who have a role to play in the program will be able to uh, do their role, implement their mandate, in order to realize mass affordable housing. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Irene. Um, let me go then move to uh, Housing uh, Finance Bank, um, Michael. Um, the issue around making the products that we have currently at the Housing Finance Bank actually affordable and the issues around addressing demand and supply side constraints. Um, what do you think can be done? And maybe any other additional recommendation uh, that is actionable and feasible uh, from you. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Jimmy. And I think uh, therein lies the challenge. Uh, one of the key challenges that we have an oversupply of high-end stock, housing stock, uh, and, and this exists around a deficit of more affordable housing. So we have a deficit and you've all spoke to it. Uh, the key challenge for us is in uh, the bottom of the pyramid, low to medium, medium income. There, we, there, there is the biggest challenge. So there have been a number of constraints and uh, I think on the demand side, we see um, constraints, uh, the informal sector comes, you know, there's a large informal sector and that brings in aspects of eligibility, eligibility to, to be able to access funding uh, for, for, for mortgages, you know, I mean, for that's from individual owners, homeowners, you know, trying to acquire homes. We have the high cost of funding, which uh, all the panelists have spoken to that continues to be a, a big challenge in terms of reducing this um, key challenge we are dealing with. Uh, you know, loans being 17% uh, bare minimum, you find that still on the high side and really plays into impediments that would have otherwise uh, freed up this space. We have the aspect of collateral. I think that has been ably uh, discussed and has is, is been with us for some time less a significant percent of chunk of our land in Uganda is still untitled uh, and, and uh, whenever you want to access funding from all these former institutions collateral remains a big issue even when uh, there had been innovation and, and I will speak to that later that hasn't quite removed the challenge uh, looking at the supply side constraints you find that um, uh, there's, there's a lot different of housing stock and, and, and that there are a few players. We, you know, you can only count them, I think less than 20 key developers. Actually, previously, individual developers were the highest, uh, could be a significant volume of houses on the market. Now we've seen emergence of, you know, kind of various developers coming to the market to, to, to deliver um, middle to low income houses, but with not much success in the low space in the bottom of the pyramid. They, they still, the big space they are playing in is, is really middle income and, and uh, that doesn't quite address our problem. Even for these developers, financing remains a big issue uh, in terms of uh, to be able to, to solve the problem adequately. So that still uh, 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 presents challenges. And you cannot run away from the, also the high construction costs that I think uh, Deb spoke to in his presentation in terms of uh, if it's only 50 percent, where's the other cost? So the high construction cost, you know, really continue to be. So for me, the strategies must be strategies that will close the demand and supply mismatch, uh, and they should focus on increasing affordability. Focus on increasing affordability, and, and for me, and, and this for me is as I close. If housing indeed remains the cornerstone for the development of our economy, 
then this development strategy and related development initiatives sure it will go a long way in uh, in focusing all partners in the right direction. And, and for me, this is key because one of the key challenges is for us to farm up this, but then not move to really go ahead to see how we implement this. So more importantly for me, efforts in implementing the said strategies need to be deliberate across all stakeholders. And the aspect of collaboration, I think Jimmy and, and panelists use the word coordination, I'll use collaboration, must be emphasized if we are going to be able to work uh, to address the issue of affordability. But so, Michael, we are losing you. Particularly uh, for the bottom of the pyramid, but not only this, it's also uh, that we address aspects of that, um, of that, uh, of, the, of closing that gap. Thank you very much, Jimmy, um, and the panelists and uh, FSB for, for, for writing. Thank you, I'll keep it here. You're welcome. Um, we'll go to Pride Microfinance, Executive Director, Edward. Um, any recommendations on your side? Um, focusing on what you, you did discuss with us, the issue on microfinance products for financing um, housing. Um, any recommendations in, in that, that area? Uh, yes, Jimmy, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, think, I think the panelists have said uh, a number of things uh, around financing, uh, providing for lower interest rates and, uh, but I just want to add two things uh, very importantly for us uh, in the microfinance sector and possibly in the entire financial uh, industry. One is the issue of the support services uh, being part of the offer. Uh, you know, as we support uh, the, the, the smaller people, the small in terms of uh, the, the dwellings and the, the, the houses they're building, it is very important to offer services uh, that, that, that would support them uh, as they are putting up uh, these buildings or the housing. One of the things that can be done uh, is the certification of local artisans uh, uh, to, to support these, these, these constructors, uh, the real people doing giving the work. This is where institutions like, for example, FSDU uh, and, and, and CAF can come in uh, to provide for certification such that uh, when, when, when these people are doing their work, uh, they can do good, 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 good due diligence and support uh, the constructors, but also the borrowers. The other thing that is key is the flexibility in, in collateralization, you know, including Vivanja. And, and I'm talking from a point of a person, like I said, at a microfinance level, where you, you're going to be presented with uh, all sorts of uh, uh, security and collateral for persons to, 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 to be able uh, to get loans or to be assisted uh, in construction. And, and one of the things that can be done is maybe do some kind of guarantees. Uh, if I'm going to work with uh, institutions, uh, maybe like uh, IB, like FSDU and any other uh, institution in the, in, the, in the industry or in the country, is there some form of guarantee that can be offered uh, to, 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 to the lender to extend to the person on the ground if they do not have this form of security that is required? Can, can, can they be a guarantee of 50% to say that should something go wrong along the way, then we shall come in to support that way, I'm also driven to offer relatively uh, affordable financial services, but also uh, bigger, bigger loans uh, that can be of, of, of importance to the person uh, doing the construction. And then uh, the other thing is the digitization of the land, land registry. I think it is very important. This will support uh, in terms of verification uh, but also will support uh, in, in form of tightening on the fraudster 
that, that are quite many. I think the other things have been talked about, the subsidizing of the, the finances, uh, incremental construction needs, but maybe the last one is the strategic interventions that are very key. Uh, people have talked about collaboration uh, and, 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 and coordination, but how can we come together as a, and possibly of consortium financing in a way, how can we work with estate developers uh, to, 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 to find a way of, of building a lower level uh, scale uh, houses as opposed to the 170 million, the, uh, the 200 million housing facilities? How can we be able to offer housing or dwellings that are in the ranges of 50 million, of, of, of 80 million, 30 million that be, can be afforded uh, by the local or the lower person? Uh, in the pyramid. Otherwise, I thank you so much. Uh, I thank you for, for, for putting this together. I thank the panelists, and I leave it at that. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Um, so finally, we will hear from, from Matthew. Uh, Matthew, last remarks uh, from you in terms of uh, what can be done um, as we discuss the matter of Making housing affordable at scale, um, yeah. Um, what can be done? What What do you see? What uh, last remarks can you put across to to this uh, panel? Uh, um, thank you, Jimmy. I think the biggest frustration for most developers, private and institutional, is uh, is the burden of the infrastructure costs. So my, my hope would be that some kind of intervention from the government in as far as um, coming up with a, say for example, there's no, as I build housing, residential housing to sell and I incurred uh, costs in as far as roads uh, and a private sewer treatment, a wastewater treatment facility are concerned. There's no framework in place for me to get, uh, to get that money back, okay? Say, Umeme comes close in as far as if you bring bulk power, there's a framework in place where you can be compensated for the actual investment you've made on the grid. And as far as these other infrastructure costs are concerned, there's no, there's no framework in place for, for developers to recoup some of that investment back. So I think that that could be a, a, an avenue for direct intervention. Assist, aid, aid the developers, help them, help them uh, increase the turnover of, uh, of products that they're putting out there. And with increased competition and increased supply of product, then maybe the pricing would go down because it's a very competitive space. The money then have to be, it could be in form of tax credits. It could be in form of, of, of something, some, some kind of mechanism to, 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 to act as an incentive for, for increased activity and turnover in that space. Uh, and then on the demand side of housing, I think, I think, I think if, if, if say for example, NSF or any other developer came up with a, a rent to own innovative scheme, there should be uh, significant incentives on the part of the government. To, say for example, this is in a slightly different space by unit trusts. Unit trusts are collective investment vehicles that are not taxed withholding tax on the coupon payments they receive in, in the fixed income investment state. So it's an incentive to, for collective savings schemes, they don't tax them on the condition that the bulk of their money is, is, is passed through to the, to the final investor, which who is the consumer. So my thinking is that that could be something that could be explored, that whoever is going to put up a project uh, and, and, the, and the underlying concept is uh, consumers can rent it for a period and eventually own it. Uh, there should be significant uh, incentives on that part so that that developer's effective interest rate is lower than the mortgage rates or, or the cost of borrowing financing. And then maybe one more intervention was, was highlighted by David is, is, is uh, improve the, 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 the actual investment climate, right? have more products in the financial markets. I think more funding should go to the capital markets authority uh, for, for sensitization of the masses, for creation and, and, and aiding of these products that would increase the, 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 the financing of, of uh, so certain projects so that developers can get in and out of projects that they, 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 uh, they come up with. 
I think that's that's my those are my initial thoughts on the matter. Okay. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Matthew, and thank you very much, um, everyone who was in the panel um, from Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Lands, Housing Finance Bank, Pride Microfinance, and NSSF uh, representatives. Uh, we really appreciate having you and giving us uh, insights from your respective uh, viewpoints from where you stand, uh, which in my opinion, gave uh, so much life um, into um, the study, uh, the presentation, there's a report, but also the presentation that, that uh, David uh, made. So more or less bringing the issues home, domesticating them. And also thank you for your, your, your thoughts, your minds on uh, what uh, we can do as partners in this space. Um, uh, going forward. Um, I think that we, as you heard from uh, the previous um, opening remarks uh, from, from Rashmi, from my executive director, we have some plans, we have some thoughts. And in collaboration with CAF, we should be able to put in place a few of these thoughts uh, strategically together and get back to you on a number of things or a few things that we think are feasible, we think that uh, are practical, we think that we can do within our means uh, to push forward the agenda that we have been discussing in this, in this panel, in this webinar, the matter of making housing uh, affordable uh, to many. Um, I think I will have to take us back to, to, to my colleague, Diana, um, uh, for the next uh, step. Thank you very much, everyone, and the panelists. Great. Thank you, Jimmy, and thanks a lot to our panelists for a very dynamic um, conversation, which brings me to um, hand over the presentation to Kesha Rust, who's the executive director of the Center for Affordable Housing Finance in Africa, who will share some of her reflections from the highlights of the panel and talk about the way forward. Kesha, over to you. Diana, thank you very much. And thank you also, Rashmi and Jimmy, for the opportunity. This has been the most fantastic discussion, and I'm really so excited. I'm also quite aware that in Uganda, it's dinner time. Um, so I'm going to speak as quickly as possible and, and just conclude and say how thrilled we are at CAF to be working with, with, with Rashmi, with you and your team at FSD Uganda. Um, and really excited to see that housing is being embraced within Uganda as a key economic sector, which also meets a very important social need. And that those two things go together and, and each are important and dependent on the other in order for, for us to get the real value out of this opportunity in this sector. Um, one thing that came out so strongly from all of the speakers um, and indeed in the presentation, and it's common across the continent, is that housing is a multi-stakeholder sector and it brings in people from all different segments of the economy who otherwise would be operating in silos. But we have to coordinate them in the housing sector and quite critically, finance is such an excellent mechanism to improve the efficiencies of those linkages between the different sectors and to focus attention on the particular goals. So I think the role for FSD Uganda in facilitating the conversation, in, in highlighting and insisting upon um, the, the role of housing finance in the whole housing process is, is a critical one and, and really interesting. Everyone in this discussion spoke about different elements along the housing delivery value chain. Um, the, the commissioner from, from the Department of, of Land and Housing and Urban Development spent a lot of time talking about infrastructure and that was raised by, by a range of different people and infrastructure is something that we should be paying over a hundred years, not over, over the immediate cost within a development itself because it is a long-term investment. And for that, we very badly need municipal capacity as well to be able to manage that and manage the payment of that over a long term. Um, and within that, we need land titling, which is something I believe that, that, that Edward raised um, from, from Pride. And 
there are so many components along that housing value chain from land assembly through to land titling and then infrastructure and construction, which is both the building materials and the labor, um, and then the sales and the offtake and the rental, um, and then the long-term management. Some speakers spoke about housing quality as well, that we're making investments here that are long-term investments, significant for the country because housing is, the housing sector is an asset for the country and significant for the household because that creates an asset base that the household can use as they manage the risks and the and, and the upheavals in their immediate economy. Um, and that really contributes to their long term resilience. And that's obviously something that we've all felt so powerfully and palpably in this past year. Um, a couple issues that stand out really critically for me and where I can see that there's synergy. The one the one is infrastructure and how do we blend the fun, or think about the financing of infrastructure as a key ingredient into a housing process and how it's quite different um, from, from other kinds of investments and needing to bring together the long-term financiers, the capital markets, um, as was said, together with municipal capacity to manage that um, and then national government capacity as well. So infrastructure. Um, then there was a lot of discussion about informality and just to talk about informality first on the demand side and, and the awareness that the majority of urban dwellers are earning incomes that are probably not easily um, engageable by the financial sector. So they may be informally earned or they might be cyclical based seasonal. Um, they, they, there are different ways in which those are, are collected. And so there's a real need on the part of the financial sector to be able to develop its, its, its capacity to lend for informal income specifically for housing. Um, and I think there's a lot of work to be done around that. And I wanted to challenge and I would love a discussion with the NSSF um, perhaps that's something we could do about, could we do some analysis on your database of clients to really understand the housing affordability in particular? The data that you shared was tremendous. And to really begin to understand that data from the housing perspective, not only in terms of what you're delivering, but in terms of what the nation is delivering and how might some of your very low income earners be served by other developers. Um, or other housing processes in the market. I think there's an interesting opportunity to better understand the demand side and you have such an enormous database that could be a really powerful um, exercise to undertake. Um, then, um, so that then also talks about new housing markets and many spoke about this, this middle class and that's lower in middle income earners and, and how critical, and there's an opportunity there because there is earning. And so there is a market opportunity to deliver. It's just about how we package those products. Um, the, the, the role for FSD Uganda in this whole process, I mean, so many people are talking about, uh, about what they're going to do along the value chain. And I think for, for Jimmy and, and, and Rashmi and, and Diana, you've seen, you've heard, there is so much for FSD Uganda to do on the finance side. End user finance issues relating to financial products, both mortgage and non-mortgage and then the linkage with savings um, and, and cooperatives and SACOs and how to integrate all of that together. Um, I'd also like to suggest that sometimes your demand side becomes the supply side through small scale landlordism. And so the ability to deliver supply side housing finance to individuals, not just companies. Um, because if everybody builds a rental unit in their backyard, you then have double the amount of housing um, suddenly, just so. So there is something to be said for small household level investment on the supply side as well. And to think about the financing of that is interesting and there's some really good precedent in other countries as well that we could share. Um, on the construction side, construction finance is often overlooked, um, very difficult to access and so many issues surrounding it, partly because of the land titling and the infrastructure issues, um, but also because lenders are unfamiliar with, with the building process and that's a kind of SME, the, the, the developer, um, that lenders are often unfamiliar with. So thinking about the kind of construction finance that would facilitate 
that might, it doesn't need to be a 20 year mortgage um, because that's your takeout finance for your, if it's mortgage finance, but it might be seven to 10 year money, which is an interesting space of, of money to, to collect and arrange to be available for, for the construction side and thinking about that. And of course, small scale developers have different needs and different capacities to large scale developers. And it's important to understand both because in fact, given the scale of demand, we can't not attend to anyone who's in the supply side. We want to include the breadth of capacity that's there. Um, then there are also um, the finance value chain itself. So how do you link the savings to the loans, to the wholesale capital, to the investment capital and create that the risk underpins and the supports throughout the finance value chain so that the investor up at the capital markets side can recognize the opportunity that's being expressed by a household who's putting their money into a SECO. How do you make those connections that improve the, the, the movement of capital um, so that it really does benefit low income earners, but it engages also with the large scale capacity of larger investors. Um, I've spoken about infrastructure finance. And then of course there's, there's um, the, the blended finance arrangements and how one puts those together. And again, then the link of everything that was said um, from, the, from, from the Ministry of Land and, and Housing and Urban Development um, to make that value chain secure. I was very excited to hear or to read in the comments um, that the commissioner from the Department of Finance, uh, from the Ministry of Finance, Mofped, has agreed how critical housing, housing is from as an economic growth sector and a, a willingness to engage with, that, with the housing ministry around how do, how do we give reality to that in the policies um, and, and, and systems that exist. Um, there was a really interesting comment that was made around how do you connect land to banks? Um, and, and, and that has to do with titling and the digitization of the deeds registry. And how do you connect, improve all of those additional factors that undermine the lending ability? And, and I think that FSD Uganda has excellent experience on, on technology, on the opportunities of technology and how to apply that in the financial sector and to facilitate the conversation between what's happening in the land ministry and the digitization process with what the lenders need. That's a conversation that's really worth having. And I think that that's a role also that, that FSD Uganda would be able to, to facilitate. Um, we could use the construction cost benchmarking methodology to also support the interrogation of alternative building materials and, and where they support efficiencies or, or undermine them. Um, that tool doesn't only have to look backwards, it can also be used as a tool to look forwards. And certainly we've done that in South Africa um, and we've worked with specific, specific projects to cost those and in other countries as well. So I think there's a nice opportunity there. So let me just conclude and say that, that CAF um, is very, very keen to work in Uganda. We're also supported by the French Development Agency, AFD, who I believe are, are participating in this call. And they're also quite in, engaged in, um, in the housing sector. So we have a nice opportunity for collaboration of all sorts of parties who, who are interested and have resources to, to apply to the opportunity for affordable housing. Um, we have done some work previously with FSD Uganda, which, which is tangentially relevant to this. We did some great work on the demand side, looking at housing, the chronicles of housing investment, how do households actually pay for their housing in real life. And we, it was a qualitative survey with a number of households to ask them how they pulled together all the different pieces of money together into their purchase of a house or investment in a house. And then we've done some nice work on rental. And currently we have a, a, a data agenda underway. That's the last thing. This, this whole presentation and discussion was underpinned by, by data. And that is so critical to be shared as you've seen, because it, it's, it's exciting. It gives you an opportunity to say, this is what I'm gonna do because now I have evidence, I understand. We need to continue to build 
our data frameworks so that we can sharpen our understanding not only of what the problem is, but what the solution can be. Um, and, and I can't emphasize that enough. That's something definitely that CAF is focused on across the continent. We're very keen to be able to, to do that also with, with partners in Uganda um, so that we can build the continental housing finance and housing affordable housing discussion um, so that targeted interventions in Uganda can have, have the benefit of the collective experience. So let me finish there. Um, thank you so much for, for working with us on this um, and for convening this excellent conversation um, and such a nice audience as well to see everybody that's joined. Um, and I look forward to working with all of you in the future. Thank you so much. Great, thanks a lot for that, Kesha. And I want to conclude by thanking um, you and your team um, for the collaboration, um, which we are hoping to build out from here. Um, a very big thank you to the team at FSU, FSD Uganda and our panelists, our guests who've joined us and stayed for the duration of the call. And we look forward to using such feedback and information we get from our market engagement um, activities to inform our programming, help give direction to the research and evidence gathering that we intend to get into and also potentially explore some of the areas that um, have been identified for intervention that we can take forward from here. Um, specifically, there have been a couple of requests for meetings to explore specific areas a bit further and we'll be following up on that after today's webinar. Um, just to wrap up with a bit of housekeeping, um, we are going to make the recording of the webinar available to all the guests who attended here today. Um, so please look out for that in your emails. We will be circulating a survey, um, a feedback form that will give you the opportunity to share um, additional qualitative feedback and comments. Um, and we'd appreciate to get your response to that. And I really appreciate everybody who has participated in the Q&A um, in the chat box, which was comprehensively dealt with um, by our partners at CAP. So thank you, everybody. And we look forward to engaging you around these specific issues going forward and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Bye.